And now to the analysis of Brooks and Capehart. That is New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, columnist for The Washington Post. Hello to both of you. So good to see you on this Friday night. Uh, while, while President uh, Biden is in Texas, uh, David, he's got some problems back here at home. Uh, emerging, his COVID relief plan uh, is moving through the House of Representatives, but in the Senate, no Republicans seem to be on board. And then you had the the uh, the minimum wage part of it knocked out. Where does that leave the whole thing? Why have they had such a hard time getting Republicans on board? Well, 1.9 trillion is a lot of money. The Republican, 10 Republican senators came in with an eight, uh, 600 some odd billion dollar uh, bill, and that was just too wide a gap. So the Democrats decided we need to do this fast. We need to do this big. I'm going to interrupt go you, David. I'm going to interrupt you because we're having a little difficulty with your camera. You're not in focus. We're going to give I see give that. folks a chance to figure that out. <laughs> Apology. We're going to go to Jonathan first. So Jonathan, you get to go first. Um, okay. On this, but w w with the president's uh, COVID relief plan, wh where are we now? Well, right now, the big thing is that the minimum wage uh, piece of it, the $15 minimum wage increase, was stripped out of the bill by the Senate parliamentarian. It is something actually that President Biden signaled was coming when he did that interview with Nora O'Donnell on CBS a few weeks back, where he he you know, muse that, you know, this probably isn't going to make it into the bill. And of course, he would think that and know that, given that he's served more than three decades in the United States Senate. He is a creature of the Senate. He knows what the rules are. And so with the minimum wage piece out of the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package, I think it makes it easier to get it passed out of the Senate. Remember, both Senators Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema uh, were against, said they were against raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And so now I think it now puts the focus on all the other pieces within the COVID relief package that makes it easier, I think, for the Democrats to pass the bill with Democrat, Democratic votes only. That's assuming no other Republicans sign on to the bill. All right, David, I think we've got this straightened out, uh, sort of, almost. Yeah, we can see you pretty clearly now, which is the way we like to see you. Um, what, why do you think there have been problems uh, getting, getting Republicans on board with this COVID plan? Well, I, I thought all of my thoughts were blurry. Uh, I, you know, I think <laughs> they... they uh, well, actually, can I just mention, uh, Judge Jonathan was talking about the minimum wage piece. I think this has absolutely come yeah. a fascinating moment to see if whether we can have compromise. So the Democrats want 15. They're not going to get it. They're not, as Jonathan said, there are maybe 48 votes. They need 60. And so Mitt Romney and Tom Cotton are for 10. Joe Manchin's for 11. So can they cut a deal and get it to 12 or 13? And would that be good enough? And to me, that would be good enough. Uh, I personally think 15 is fine in places like New York and California, where the wage structure is high. But it's too high in a lot of other places. And the the Congressional Budget Office estimates that would eliminate 1.4 million jobs. That's a lot of jobs. So a $12 to $13 minimum wage would make more sense in more places. And But we'll see if Democrats are in a mood to come down and if Republicans are in a mood to go up. It's, it's, to me, it's a crucial test of whether there even can be bipartisanship, because this is a pretty simple issue where you can split the difference. And Jonathan, do you think they can? Do you think they can come together on that? I, w I would hope that they could come together on this. Look, I actually think it is a good thing and the, for the best that the minimum wage was stripped out of the COVID relief bill simply because the nation needs to have the conversation about the minimum wage, how much it should be, um, how over how much time it should be, fa it should be phased in. Um, with it stripped out, we can actually have this conversation and have the compromise uh, potentially have the compromise that David is talking about there. You know, and to his point about the minimum wage being meaning something different in other areas, you know, we have seen states um, raise the minimum wage by popular vote. Um, we saw that happen in, in Florida in 2020, where the state went for President Trump. He won the state, but 60 percent of Floridians right. voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I think it is a debate um, worth having uh, in the country. 
We, we shall see. But, David, before I let you go on that, uh, is it a problem for Joe Biden if this goes through uh, the, the COVID relief on a party line vote? It's not ideal. He ran on, yeah, he ran on bipartisanship. But, you know, this uh, bill has 70 percent support or nearly 70 percent support. I'm really struck by how little Republicans are actually fighting this. They'd rather talk about something else or near a tandem or something than, than talk about this. And I think that's because they've lost some of the big fight or the debate on fiscal uh, government spending and fiscal health. There used to be a strong, a large number of people who really did not like government spending programs, and Republicans could win elections on that. After Donald Trump, that kind of conservative is much less significant. There are fewer of them. And so Republicans have lost the overall debate on spending, and they don't seem to be able to be even trying to defeat the COVID-19. They'll let it go through on reconciliation. And Jonathan, David, David raises near a tandem, the one uh, nominee, uh, President Biden's cabinet, who does seem to be running into real problems. What do her prospects look like uh, to you? Uh, she would be the director of Office of Management and Budget. Uh, I think she absolutely should be the director of office, the Office of Management and Budget. I think the fact that her nomination is still alive says a lot about her, but it says, I think, a lot more about uh, President Biden and the Biden White House. And the fact that when they put her up for nomination, it wasn't um, for show. It wasn't as, you know, something to do. It's because the president thought she was the best person for the job and that the president is going to stick by her until which time it becomes clear, if it becomes clear, that she cannot get the votes in committee. But look, the only thing Republicans are talking about when it comes to Neera Tanden are her tweets. And after four years of President Trump and his uh, incendiary tweets against elected officials and private citizens on Twitter, tweeting things and saying things about people that um, were just uncalled for and unbecoming of a president, to then focus on tweets from Neera Tanden, Republicans who you know, would be, uh, you know, reporters would come up to them and say, you know, what's your reaction to this latest tweet from President Trump? And they feign ignorance. Oh, I've, I've not seen it. I'm not paying attention to it. All of a sudden, they're paying attention right. to tweets from Neera Tandon. It is not fair. And I just have, I chuckle at now all the tender hearts out there and the tender feelings within the Republican Party about a strong, about an, a, a woman with a point of view and values it and who was not afraid to defend them. And I'm sure, David, you can explain that. The, oh, yeah, Republicans have had a come-to-Jesus moment where incivility is completely offensive to them all of a sudden. No, I, I agree with Jonathan on that. I do, you know, I follow, I know Nero a bit, and I follow her Twitter presence. I thought just as a think tank head, she was a little loose and raucous and inappropriate, frankly. It's certainly not enough to get rid of uh, or to not nominate her as OMB director. Uh, I think there's a subtle thing going on here. For the, since I've been covering politics, since, you know, David Stockman's days, if people remember as Reagan's budget director, there's been a certain sort of person who has been the budget OMB director. And that person is a super wonky, dry personality, white male. And Neera Tannen fits none of those categories. <laughs> and so I think she's, she just doesn't... People look at her and they don't see the normal OMB director, and, and that's part of the unconscious undertone of this whole thing. Uh, but Republicans are certainly hyped up about it. I think it's the only battle they think they can win. I, I think they probably will. I think once Joe Manchin um, said he was against her, I think it's very hard for any Republican suddenly to be for her. So I think hopefully they'll find another spot in the administration for her. She's a very talented person, and they'll probably have to find somebody else for that job. And Jonathan, in the last minutes that we have, I want to ask you both about the conservative political action uh, conference, uh, CPAC, uh, taking place here uh, near Washington. The lineup of speakers, the messages coming through. What do you make of it? And President Trump will be there Sunday. Mm -hmm. right. former President, President Trump, Trump, Trump will be. Yes, former President Trump will be there Sunday. The speakers, from what I've been able to see so far, are you know hewing to the conservative line. Conservative line as it has been expressed during the four years of President Trump. And clearly, the, at least at CPAC, the far right of the Republican Party is in the hands of Donald Trump. We're going to know and find out for sure when he speaks on Sunday. But 
any thinking that because they lost the the Senate and because they lost the White House, that the Republican Party and the and the right wing of the Republican Party is going to somehow moderate itself and try to become a bigger tent? That I mean, just disabuse yourself of that notion. And what we saw today at the conference, among others, was Ted Cruz, who, as we mentioned earlier, senator from Texas, who flew off to Mexico during that terrible winter storm last week. He had some comments today. He joked about the Texas trip and then basically mocked the wearing of masks. Here's a little of what Ted Cruz had to say. Now they're saying everybody can get immunized. We can have herd immunity everywhere, and we're going to wear masks for the next 300 years. And by the way, not just one mask, two, three, four. You can't have too many masks. How much virtue do you want to signal? This is just dumb. So, David, how winning an argument is that? You know, it really strikes me about CPAC uh, is that it's not about government anymore. It's not even about politics anymore. It's culture war issues. It's either the cancel culture they're against, they're against wokeism, and I guess they're against mask wearing. The, the, this is not about a normal political party that wants to pass an agenda. The agenda, uh, political agenda, is off the table. And then as far as the mask wearing, they've made a hero of Governor DeSantis of, of Florida, maybe make, making he'll, maybe he'll be the next Republican presidential nominee. But when you actually look at the states and where they rank on effectiveness in preventing COVID infections, there's almost no correlation between the politics of the state and the infection rate of the state. Florida is like 28th, which is pretty decent for a pr state with a lot of seniors, but it's right next to California. So progressive and conservative states seem to be doing, you know, it's, it's just ra kind of random. Uh, so to turn this into an ideological issue and to be anti-science about it uh, strikes me as kind of bizarre. And just in a few seconds, Jonathan, uh, uh, we will see how far that takes Senator Cruz. Yeah, I found it interesting that he's railing against masks when we spent all, you know, week watching him wheel his uh, rotor back through an airport wearing a mask with the flag of Texas on it. I agree with, with David. CPAC is no longer about policies and issues. It's culture wars. And the clip you just showed of Senator Cruz, it's as if they're all doing stand-up. There's no real vision for the country in anything that he said in that clip you showed us. On that note, we will leave both of you. Thank you, Jonathan Capehart, David Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy.